Thanks, Monica, for uh, bringing everyone together today. It's like a syllabus come to life in here. It's really fantastic. Very exciting, and um, I think we're all really honored to be in such distinguished company. All right, so here we go. Some notes on five points towards a new charter of the mashup, urbanism. Number one, mashup is an entropic practice, a technological transgression of form as the imposition of order and identity. So in the question of what the future looks like, I think it probably looks something more and more like this. The dawn of the 21st century has thus far seen the widespread dissolution of categories. We've come to live, as uh, Kazis Varnels was saying, in the age, I think, and I agree, really, of the uh, chimera, the mythical she-monster with the head of a lion, the body of a goat, and the tail of a dragon. Both monster and mirage, I think the chimera represents incongruousness of all forms. Um, that could be from Michael Jackson to Dubai, let's say. Figments of our mediated, mediated imagination come to life. Uh, the image on the left is actually from the Australian artist Patricia uh, Piccinini. It w the title is Young Family. It was actually the subject of a kind of global internet hoax uh, not too long ago where people thought this was an actual living creature. Um, Code 46 is one of my favorite films um, from recent memory by Michael Winterbottom about the near future, or one could say the distant present. Um, the code in question is a law prohibiting either, quote, accidental or deliberate genetically incestuous reproduction, unquote, in a world of widespread in vitro fertilization, embryo splitting, and cloning. So the world the film portrays is really one of city-states stranded among deserts, where Shanghai, Seattle, and Jebel Ali become more or less indistinguishable from one another in their spatial and cultural uh, hybridity. The heroine in the film, Maria, is a counterfeiter and a smuggler of visas, that is, immigration documents, and is being pursued by a psychic detective from a multinational insurance company. It's a Romeo and Juliet story. And of course, number one, they share, as it turns out, too much of the same genetic identity. And number two, they are on opposite sides of the law. So dichotomous individuals inextric inextricably linked. Uh, one of my favorite scenes from the film is this one where um, they're flirting in a karaoke bar in a basement in Shanghai. Uh, should I stay or should I go, I think is playing. And um, he says, you know, you can take a virus to make you more musical. And she says, I tried a virus once for men in Chinese. So like Chinese people knew what I was saying, but I didn't. It was weird. So three things, hybrid city, polyphonic culture, genetic love. This is the urbanism of the future, perhaps. In the last century, though, uh, as we all know, or have been reminded several times, the modern Fortis city was really based on the replication of ideal formal types. Ebenezer Howard, Le Corbusier, Ludwig Hilmersheimer, etc., all shared the aspirations of formulating ideal cities. So, Despite abundant evidence to the contrary, they insisted that problems of urbanization, mass housing, transportation, and industrial concentration could be really solved through the elegant design and logical assemblage of urban elements at every scale, from the unit to the district on up to the region. That is, generic solutions for a generic city. This, I would argue, could um, be the mistake that we continue to repeat. So today, I'd like to uh, rethink or suggest rethinking cities as plural rather than generalized phenomena, liquid in their myriad specificities, idiosyncrasies, and heterogeneities. Uh, these are more uh, works from uh, Patricia Piccinini. The, the one on top, I think, is particularly uh, wonderfully titled. It's called Still Life with Stem Cells. So Fordism has really been supplanted by versioning, again, which is not news, I think, to this crowd. Um, but I'm concerned less here with an argument about forms and objects than one of practices and techniques. That is, how might new notions of authorship and authorial control transform the future urban imaginary? So uh, point number two, or note number two, authorship is not dead, but has been liquefied and dispersed by the crisis of copyright. Um, again, as we all know, authorial control, ownership, and copyright have become highly endangered concepts since uh, open source access to media has become the order of the day. So the last 20 years of development in communication technology have really transformed radically our entire concept of creation across the creative field. So freeware, shareware, publishing on demand, file sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we now live really in a culture of relentless variability, mashup culture, download, cut, copy, paste, Mix, burn, repeat. 
So the reformulation of authorship, though, I think is not entirely new and has a history. And so this is kind of my mashup genealogy or roll call. Um, Marcel Duchamp, who I think was men mentioned appropriately earlier, uh, was, I think, a mashup artist par excellence, progenitor of the ready-made, appropriating everyday objects and transforming their meanings through strategic inversions, repositionings, and combinations. The artist also, re also played with his identity, often assuming his alter ego, Rose Salavi, uh, phonetically translating to El Salavi, meaning love that is life. Um, also on the fringes of surrealism, I think uh, Carol Teig is really interesting. His eerie mutant figures are, I think, literal uh, chimeras, uh, constructed from erotic amputations and reconfigurations of uh, female figures, landscapes, and other things. And then, of course, there's Sergei Eisenstein, uh, the master of constructivist film montage. His battlesh Battleship Potemkin really demonstrated, demonstrated how media technologies could transform the perception of space and then be translated freely across different media and different disciplines, influencing the architectural works uh, and urbanism of that period. Across the ocean and then later on, um, I think we can look also uh, at jazz, in particular, uh, jazz poet Gill, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, Scott Heron. In his um, landmark 2007 essay, uh, the, Ecstasy, the Ecstasy of Influence, A Plagiarism, the New York novelist Jonathan Lethem recalled how, quote, blues and jazz musicians have long been enabled by a kind of open source culture in which pre-existing melodic fragments and larger musical frameworks are freely reworked, unquote. If we fast forward to early 1980s New York, hip hop exploded into being, blending spoken word techniques inherited from jazz musicians like Gil Scott Heron with turntable beats from 70s disco. And I think in many ways, uh, as the, the the slide of uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five shows. Um, hip hop has taken many practices from across all of the arts and combined them into a single creative practice. The adoption of Duchampian pseudonyms and stage names, surrealist use of language and wordplay, appropriating music by sampling as well as montage, also known as remixing and improvisation, also known as freestyling. But for me, the tipping point is in 2004, when DJ Danger Mouse, released his uh, infamous Grey album. Danger Mouse had taken the recent Black album by the hip-hop star Jay-Z and mixed it with the Beatles' White album to produce the Grey album and posted it for free on his website, of course, without any permissions. And since then, I think mashup has become part of our popular vocabulary, used to describe all things heterogeneous. But despite this ubiquity, for me, the, the Grey album incident is, is particularly uh, uh, important and, and special simply because it's this kind of classic collision of sacred whiteness with profane blackness. And I'm not trying here to make a trite assertion again about the, uh, the idea of architecture or even urbanism as frozen music. But really, what I'm interested in suggesting here is that there are compelling possibilities for urbanism within this politics of what I would call creative miscegenation. So, Number three, the mutability of urban projects over long time horizons demands the use of indeterminate media for design and representation. The problem for contemporary urbanisms, or one of the problems, I would say, is that most of our techniques of representation, plan sections, etc., are inherited from architecture. And cities tend to elude these visualizations because they're neither fixed nor inert. Our standard tools though powerful in their ability to, to form abstractions of the real, have much less power to make more real the already abstracted notions of politics, culture, time, etc. And even worse, current standard practice does not, expire to the does not aspire to the rigors of abstraction, but rather is settled for the appeasing pleasures of second-rate impressionisms, potentially dooming our urban futures to be a soft-focused version of an idealized and often false past. I would say that its full potential, urbanism is already an inherently future-oriented, preemptive, and anticipatory discourse. The long time horizons of urban projects not only encourage, but demand that we place our minds decades into the future. We must adopt the mindset, I would think, of and probably the techniques of scenario planning, constructing multiple urban futures rooted in, though not beholden, to current realities. The urban imaginary must be realized through tools 
that activate the nth dimensions of phasing, transformation, revision, and narrative. Um, I'm not gonna talk about it in much detail, and some of you have seen this project before, but these are new works around it. This is the, um, an animation of the uh, alternative proposal that I worked on for the uh, Atlantic Yards uh, development in Brooklyn, New York, which was uh, um, originally commissioned to Frank Gehry by Forest City Ratner Development Company. Uh, the project basically proposes at its core to cut the site, um, which is actually three full-size New York City blocks, into smaller sites, um, allowing the possibility of creating uh, a network of open spaces and development using multiple developers, multiple architects, uh, multiple landscape architects, et cetera, to, um, to create what we were calling a landscape of difference, which could not only stitch the site together uh, across stitch the two neighborhoods together across the yards, uh, Fort Greene and Prospect Heights, but also create uh, a kind of continuous uh, network of public and civic spaces along its length. Um, the reason I wanted to show this animation is, is really to begin the discussion of how animation can become much more a tool for construction rather than a, a, a method of creating either simulations or simulacra. But in the end, this, at the same time, this question of the perspectival image is a difficult and mostly ignored problem for the urban imagination, but one we cannot really escape. Uh, about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, Nikolai Orosov um, did a really particularly uh, interesting piece in the New York Times where he was talking about Tishman Spire's, uh, one of Tishman Spire's proposals for the uh, West Side Rail Yards. And he, he, I'll just quote quickly, he's saying, you know, uh, he's, he's talking about how basic details like the surrounding context were left incomplete, there were no elevations, et cetera, et cetera, uh, things were missing, you could see through the buildings, which was false. And he, and he says, quote, I don't mean to single out Tishman Spire for criticism here, on the contrary, the company represents the norm. Like most developers, it probably sees architectural renderings as just one element of an elaborate marketing campaign. I'm sure it's even proud of its designs, but the end result is a distorted picture of reality. Now, I would uh, sort of rebut, not distorted enough. There's a fundamental question of how to construct figurative representations of that which is as highly mutable, contingent, and volatile as most urban projects are. Simple question, what do we draw and how do we draw it? My simple answer, don't draw. Photo merge, wireframe, scan, print, pencil, knife, tape, glue, repeat. Again, to quote Jonathan Lethem, you can't steal a gift. He says, my reader may understandably be on the verge of crying, communist. A large, diverse society cannot survive without property. A large, diverse, and modern society cannot flourish without some form of intellectual property. But it takes a little reflection to grasp that there is ample value that the term property doesn't capture. And works of art exist simultaneously in two economies, a market economy and what he's calling a gift economy. So not to be too contrarian, but number four, mashup is not collage. So far, this argument may be seen as a rephrasing of Colin Rowe and Fred Coder's Collage City thesis of 1978, but when Rowe and Cotter confronted the predicament of texture, as they called it, their proposition was really a return to bricolage, or incremental, unplanned development. But unlike Collage City, mashup urbanism is not a nostalgic urbanism. Even when mashups employ old material, that material is effectively dismantled and realigned to really produce something new. So mashups, I would say, are future-oriented, contingent, temporary, or even ephemeral. And so mashup urbanism is a relentlessly me metabolic condition, what I would call form as flux rather than petrified history. Um, in terms of technique, mashup and collage, actually I'll go back, no doubt share some traits, but mashup differs from collage in a fundamental way. Collage produces incongruence through the assemblage of fragments which can often be very similar in nature, a famous example being Paul Citroen's Metropolis Collage of 1923. But, and without criticism, I would put each of these three projects up here, which I think many of us owe a lot to, um, in the category of collage, the attempt to produce a heterogeneity of disjunction through fragmentation, collision, or simple juxtaposition. 
Disjunction is not the ambition of Mashup, which aspires to be a strategic fusion of programmatic, organizational, and formal conditions. Therefore, for, though it begins with acts of creative destruction, Mashup is nonetheless an affirmative practice. And five, finally, Mashup dismantles the politics of dichotomy with recombinant practices. It provides techniques which we can finally embrace, with, with which we can finally embrace negotiation, assemblage, and indeterminacy as the sine qui bis known of urbanism. I would say that, you know, mashup is really a practice where the standard methods of conventional urbanism are dislodged and dispersed within a fluid landscape of strategic integration. When incongruous demands, whether programmatic, typological, or otherwise must be negotiated, the boundaries between them dissolve into frontiers, a space full of differences in which the opportunities for overlap, cross-fading, and mixing can be found. And so, whether it's the collapse of the urban-suburban dichotomy, or real estate battles which continue to pit community activists against developers, I think that our discourse can play a more effective and creative role in transforming these debates if we overcome certain prejudices about what forms are proper to urbanism. So as culture becomes e increasingly fluid and hybridized, so does the urban landscape, producing situations for which the conventional epistemology of urban form provides few tools to either uh, understand or confront. So to conclude, Lethem finally says that, you know, artists are paradoxically trying to restore what's taken for real to three whole dimensions, to reconstruct a univocally round world out of disparate streams of flat sites. Whatever charge of tastelessness or trademark violation may be attached to the artistic appropriation of the media environment in which we swim, the alternative to flinch or to tiptoe away into some ivory tower of irrelevance is far worse. We are surrounded by signs. Our imperative is to ignore none of them. I will simply add to that, steal all of them. Thank you. <laughs>